Hi everyone, welcome to Being Black Emory. Uh, today's topic will be on gatekeeping blackness, who we define as black, um, who can participate in black culture, that sort of thing. Uh, my name is Jasmine Bovia, I'm gonna be the facilitator. Uh, we're gonna jump straight into it, but first, can we introduce our panel, starting with Danielle. So, hi, I'm Danielle, I'm a second year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, hi, I'm Matt, I'm a second year, my pronouns are he, him, his. My name is Amari, I'm a third year, my pronouns are she, her, hers. My name is Carice, I'm a third year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Yana, I'm a third year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Marissa, I'm a first year, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Inyan, I'm a second year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm Jonathan, I'm a fourth year, and my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a fam, I'm a fourth year, my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm Serafina, I'm a second year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, my name is Joy. I am a first year, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Good. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, and we're just going to jump straight into it. So I know we sent out a survey asking all of our panelists, what makes a person black? And I know we gave you all um, just a few factors that we thought you'd like to consider. So I know we mentioned culture, biology, phenotype. And I know the response was like super varied. Uh, so does anybody want to jump in and say what they think makes a black person and why? I think what makes a black person is Really, really just their genotype and lineage. Mm -hmm. I feel like phenotypically, phenotype can always be like very diverse amongst black people. And that even if you don't think you have a quote unquote black culture, you still are black. That's still your lineage and that's something you can't escape. You can't escape from the black experience just because you have maybe a culture that some black people may not deem as black. I agree with him. Uh, in my response, I don't remember exactly what I put, but um, I talked about how like if you come from black people and you're black, like it's kind of crazy for me to think that somebody would tell somebody else that they're not black because they don't fit a certain, I guess, mold of what it means to be black. Because like, uh, like all of us are black, but all of us here don't like the same things or like probably don't act the same. But we're all black. Okay. Does anybody think that phenotype is a factor? I think like, um, it's more about how other people see you, and. Like, blackness isn't really an experience until whoever is perceiving you as black turns it into an experience. So the fact that, you know, um, historically black people have been put in a position that is um, inferior. And that is where, you know, your lineage comes from. Okay. So, Amari, I saw you nodding. Do you care to add? Um, I would say phenotype is a thing because it's really how, like, society is hailing you, so it really doesn't have, you can identify as black all day, but if no one is treating you, or if you're navigating systems, and you can navigate the system as a white person or as a non-black person, because that looks different too, um, I think that is a really big deciding factor in it. Like, oh, we can scream black culture all day, but like, are you actually being like treated, subjugated to blackness when you like move through spaces, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. My question is, would you say if someone is able to pass through the systems, like let's say they're white passing, are you saying they're less black than someone who is not white passing? Because like you're saying that phenotype is something that um, determines whether someone is black. And mm -hmm. like, for instance, my daddy, he's, he's white passing, but like he's still um, treated a certain way, especially when he grows his hair out because his hair is really curly. Mm -hmm. And like he's still treated as if like he's a normal black person, but I'm just confused as to what, why phenotype is a huge concern. The reason why your dad gets articulated as black is because his hair type, right? So yeah. like, that's like, not to say that your skin, like obviously skin color is a very, or a rather, I don't know, more important fact, or not more important, but like 
significant factor in that. But like your dad is getting articulated as black because he does have quote unquote nigga hair. So like <laughs> understanding how like phenotype also just features all of those things and that I, I don't know, I guess hair is like a really big signifier of that. Um, but also, yeah, I think that's the reason why your dad gets articulated as black. So it's not to say that like someone who's like light skin or something won't be articulated as black, but it, like it does really come down to like a lot of times phenotype and how you even get treated versus whether you are a dark person or a light person, right? That also is like, uh, phenotype also just comes to matter a lot in those cases. I'd like to add something. In my um, questionnaire, I put culture and, um, bi culture and biology, but hearing kind of Amari speak to me from um, the phenotype kind of feeds into the culture a little bit. I feel like people who culturally identify as black who quote unquote look black, um, I feel like more people are like, oh, that's, that's a black person. But I feel like when we have white passing, I feel like the term white passing, you know, people who looked white passing chose to pass as white in a way because it, I mean, back in the day, if you're white passing, you're like, if I can go and, you know, pass as white, then I will. So I feel like a big part of that is choice. Your dad can kind of choose to grow his hair up or cut his hair depending on how he wants to be perceived, you know? Mm -hmm. So I feel like phenotype um, and culture kind of interact at acceptance. You can kind of accept it or you can't, so. I just think that your phenotype kind of, like Amari was saying, hails certain violences. And I think that a big aspect of being black is the violence that manifests because you are black, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that white passing people can often shift in and out of that. And I think it is to acknowledge that people who have darker skin, kinkier hair, and cannot pass for white manifest a certain violence that white passing people never have to face if they don't want to. And I think that that privilege and choice is essentially different. And I think that's why phenotype matters so much. And it's not to deny them their culture. Like, yeah, you can be like, um, I'm Caribbean or I'm, I'm American, right? Like, it's not to deny them that culture, but it is to say that they can shift in and out of what people deem as blackness. I know we talked a lot about white passing then um, by everyone's definition of white passing. How do you feel about white passing black people using the N-word or partaking in black culture? Amara, I see you shaking your head already. How do you feel? I mean, just going off of what Karee says, right? Like understanding that, and I don't even like to use the word white passing because if you white, you're white. You're white. I don't feel like you can speak Spanish, you're just still white. You're just a white person who speaks Spanish. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think it like, a lot of it does, I don't know, I don't like it. I have friends who are like non-black passing and so they actively choose not to to say nigga because they understand that they won't, like that is not, not to say that, I mean nigga is wrapped up in a specific experience and we can talk about that as well, but like. It translates differently. Yeah. Yes, um, and I think it's understanding that like when they do use that word, some people might just look at them like. Huh? And I am one of those people. Um, <laughs> I, I, I personally just feel like if I see someone who looks, um, let's just say Zendaya, she got a blonde wig on, right? <laughs> if, if I hear her saying nigga, 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 I'm gonna be like, bitch, what? Wait, 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 <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Like, it's just, I'm, it's not even to discount their black experience. It's more so, like we were saying, with that choice, they can put their foot in and put their foot out. Sometimes when you have your foot out, I can't tell where you're at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes that is a fact that I'm not gonna say that, you know, they can't say it. But you know, be aware of what your phenotype expresses when I'm interpreting what you're saying. And the privilege is wrapped up in your phenotype. You know what I'm saying? One thing I've been like noticing is like everybody who's been like talking about phenotype, y'all have always brought it back to how phenotype is indicative of your struggle. And so a lot of people who are like, you know, identifying as black or choosing to uh, pass for white, you're choosing to partake in the struggle, you're choosing to ignore the struggle that, you know, black people have gone through. And it's almost like I'm getting the sense that like being black is not necessarily your race, but more of a sense of the shared struggle that, you know, your parents have gone through, their parents have gone through, the fights you have had to, you know, twice as much for half as little. Mm -hmm. And so now it's like, you know, when we're talking about, you know, white passing people using the N-word, it's like, y'all y'all are y'all are choosing to step out of that struggle. Y'all have, you know, y'all have waved the white flag, y'all have put down your arms. Y'all don't get to partake, you know saying the n-word because that's not your word you, you don't get to claim you know the yo this nigga over here funny as hell when you're saying oh well i'm gonna just forget the whole hard r you know nigger this nigger that 
for me, when I think of like what it means to be black, I think that it's so much deeper than your genotype, your phenotype, because we have a lot of people, especially in today's world of like black fishing, who can modify oh. those things, who can like make themselves look black, right? So that muddies the waters even further. Mm -hmm. So when I think of what it means to be black, I'm thinking of like the black experience, right? There's a certain way that black people can interact and um, they have certain family traditions and family values that have nothing to do with like, like, essentially like racial ties like this is just purely black that i feel like is more defining of what it means to be black than say things that are so easily modifiable like skin color or okay. hair texture mm -hmm. and do you mind defining black fishing i heard you use that term i just want to make sure everybody knows it. um well, from my understanding black fishing is this um is the use of whatever products to like make themselves look like black people mm -hmm. this is predominantly done by like uh, I've seen it mainly on like white or like European influencers on social media, you know, they'll Spray. like, yeah, they'll do whatever to their hair to make it look like, to make it look curly or they'll darken their skin like way past self tanning to the point where they actually look black for the black aesthetic, mm -hmm. you know, for like, oh, it looks good to be black. Um, and so from that point of view, without going too far into their genealogy, I mean, they look black, right? So the truly identifying as black to me comes deeper than your race, deeper than your genealogy. Got it. I would like to say though, like, I think that even if a white passing black person is in a situation where they do acknowledge their black side, I, I'm just gonna say this, I feel some type of way when they use the n-word because even though they identify with their black side, when they go out into larger society, a white woman is not gonna clutch her purse when she sees that white passing person. Someone's not gonna cross the street because they don't feel safe next to this white passing person. So I feel like, again, even though we can sit here and be like, it's your culture, it's really how society also defines you. And I feel like in certain instances, if say you're not identifying with any culture, and you're just walking down the street. If someone articulates you as white and you can navigate the space as a white person and feel free to walk down the street without fear of violence manifesting against your body, then I just I feel some type of way when they say the N word. There's like a lot of non-white passing black people that do the same thing with their white groups exactly. and they still may identify as black, but That's true. they still try to assimilate and to um, whether or not they're allowed to say the N-word. I personally also agree that the N-word is really complex. I personally don't think any black person should use it because I don't see how we're taking it back if some people, I feel like most of the time the N-word gets used, is used in a derogatory way, like I'm going to shoot these niggers or I'm, a, you know, that's what I'm saying. So it's like, I'm really like on the fence with that. And one more thing I wanted to say was just that for like white, I, I know like white passing black people might get some privileges when nobody knows them, but once they find out about that black parent, I feel like that changes a lot of things. And history has shown that. Like there was a um, Supreme Court case in the 1800s, I forgot the man's name. Plessy versus Ferguson. Yeah, that one. Yeah, he was like one eighth black. But once they found out about that lineage of black, he was treated just like a regular black person. So I feel like once they, that's why I feel like lineage supersedes. Yeah, twice people have said regular black person or normal black person and like I just don't understand what that means. Like to what degree does someone have to be black for their genetics to determine that? Um, I don't think I mean I'm not one hundred percent black. I don't think most of us are probably. Okay, then I'm gonna throw this question out there. Um, do you all think that lighter skinned black people are less black than darker skinned black people? I know when we sent this survey out, we got a mixed response, so I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I think what matters is the experience. Like when we're talking about less black or more black, I think it's more so to say like, I'm not gonna say you're less black or more black based on your skin tone, but based on like when we're talking about phenotype, phenotype will influence a lot of what you experience. So if you are somebody who is lighter, despite whether you are, um, like whether your biology says you're a certain percent black, a certain percent white, based on how you look, people are going to treat you like a different kind of black. I'm not going to say you're less or more, but they're going to treat you like a certain kind of black. So if you are a lighter skinned person and you have features that people can say are more acceptable or more um, something that can assimilate more with, with their idea of, of American should be or what black should be, they're going to treat you in a better way than they would a black person who looks very visibly black um, or, or more similar to a stereotype that they don't like. And that's just based on what people are going to have to deal with. But I feel like if we're going to sit here and say that we want to celebrate blackness, right, appreciate blackness in all its forms, we have to do just that. 
I don't think that it's fair to sit here and draw a line and say, well, lighter skin, or if you're just this percentage, then maybe you're a little less black, or your experience is different from us. Even though you are black, we're definitely going to draw that line and like make that demarcation. I feel like that's just a, another divisive factor. You know? But it's not, it's not yeah. to say that there are not black. Yeah. It's not to say that they can't identify with this experience, but you have to you know, call a spade a spade. Someone, <laughs> some kinds of people experience certain things and other people don't. And you need to recognize how do we solve that problem rather than, oh, we're all black in the same way. And I feel it's like different. more black people, I mean, more like of the lighter skinned people it applies to, um, they make the demarcation line, I feel like, more than we do. Especially growing up, light skin is the right skin, things like that. It's mm -hmm. there, I feel like growing up, they enforced that delineation, that power. Exactly onto us growing up. They were calling so us roaches, many, like... Yeah, like, I've, I've gotten called a roach many times. <laughs> and then, like, to speak on swirl culture as well, there's a different type of blackness. There's a pretty type of blackness. Like, oh, that makes baby so damn cute. With or good hair. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, that's yeah. a that's an acceptable, cute type of blackness. It's still black, nevertheless. That person's still black, but is their black experience based on, oh, they're cute and swirly, or, oh, they're threatening and they are scary. So I feel like swirl culture is something we have to definitely talk about if we're gonna talk about who's more black, because they make that distinction, we have to make that distinction, and then other people definitely make that distinction, so. I think a big part of like your black experience based on skin tone, I feel like it has less to do with how white or non-black people perceive you, and most of how other black people perceive you, because there's a lot of dark skin Black people that feel the same way about their dark skin um, counterparts, like they may say colorist things to them as well. And I feel like it's, when it comes to like non-black people, I feel like it's more about your attitude. Because from my personal experience, in my high school, there was a darker skin black person, and they like the white kids liked him a lot more because he was more assimilated. Uh, can talk. He assimilated a lot more to them, but I was more so. I didn't really care to be in their group, and I told them how I felt about them when they made little remarks to me even though I was the lighter one. So I feel like it's really just based on your attitude when it comes to non-whites and more so on appearance when it comes to black people because I feel colorism and just skin tone is just another way that white supremacy has used skin tone to further divide black people and force us to have conversations like this where we have to address it. When that question I said like a hard no, like as soon as I saw it, like I don't think you can automatically like look at somebody and just because they're light skin judge them and be like, or they may do this, this, and this. I think it's important for them to be aware that like they have certain privileges like everybody's talked about. Like if they're in white spaces, they come off less threatening. But um, I mean, it's like Jonathan was saying just now too, like um, you have dark skinned people who assimilate better in white spaces and like vice versa. So, so like um, really, I just think it's important um, for lighter skinned people to understand that they do have privileges um, and it does like benefit them um, in a way that it they can't benefit like someone like my skin tone, like a darker skin person. All right, so I know we talked about um, lighter skin people and them having privilege and them being seen as like the beacon of beauty in the black community. Uh, but do you feel like there's any way in which darker skin people are actually fetishized and are upheld as like the standard for what blackness looks like? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you uh, look at the image of dark skin people in black culture, um, when dark skin is beautified, we're talk, uh it's to the point where like it, people are being painted like black and it's used to contrast you know gold light if you're not you know this regal image of darkness essentially you're not beautiful you know you're not going to look at like you, you, uh, wow i just lost my train of thought for a second but you don't typically see them going like oh here's you know just like i don't know it's like a normal skin tone um what's normal uh, yeah, what's well, normal? Um, you, you don't see them, uh, you don't typically see, you know, an uh, ad campaign, you know, let's say somebody like my complexion, you know, like, doll them up and it's like, oh, they're cute, you know, that's what y'all should be striving for, you know, it's either you're totally on the light skin side of the spectrum or you're pushing it all the way to the dark end of the spectrum. There is no, like, there's no appreciation for, you know, what's the actual, you know, color of your skin. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with everything you said, and I had two things. So one, you were talking about like places where I guess being darker is better. It's actually funny. Um, so I'm Nigerian, and when I was born, I was I was a little bit lighter than you, and my mom was nervous because in Nigeria, like for men specifically, the lighter you are as a man, the more like I guess the less manly you come off or like uh, people think you are. 
So um, that that was just funny that you brought that up because in Nigeria, like if, if you're darker as a man, it's considered like you're more manly. Um, and then to go off more what you said, like another thing too I see is like um, on Instagram, like when dark it's when darker skinned people post things, there'll be comments like, oh my gosh, like my my dark queen or like look at the skin. Mm -hmm. But then like when people like like let's say your complexion, I would post a picture. No one's saying like my toffee colored. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like it's like why can't you just be beautiful? Why does it have to be like all about like your skin? You know what so, I mean? Like, like you gotta point out like how dark the skin. I'm gonna disagree with that. Like yes, I know like they like grease them up and put them on Instagram, but I, but niggas don't want that shit in real life, right? They're like, no, no, no. we could take all that dark shit on the internet. You're so beautiful, my melanated right. queen. No, you but you walk to their face in real life, they be like, get on my face, no, you cockroach. Not... Like, I, that's the energy. So I feel like, yeah, we say that dark we, we're putting dark skin on a pedestal and now we're like fetishizing it, but that shit is only, that's that's hype for the internet. No, no. That's not that hype in real life. Yeah, no, I agree with you, you 100. Yeah. I, that's literally, I was gonna get into that too. I agree with you 100%, like it's all cat. And I think it goes uh, the same way Somebody wants to agree with me they, or disagree with me, they can. But like for men, like how they be talking about, like, oh, I don't like light skins because they're too sensitive and all this stuff. Like it's all for the the internet, just the clout, or just to get likes and stuff. There's a big difference between how darker skin people are fetishized when it comes to um, black men and black women. Yes. So you know, if you're a black man, I think there's a tendency for people to say, oh, yeah, like like also you, you brought up white women especially. That's another huge complex, like white women going for I guess the blackest idea of a black man that they could find, typically a dark-skinned black man. Um, but I just feel like there's a difference between how dark-skinned black men are fetishized, where you don't really see that in real life with dark-skinned black women because of what's associated with black masculinity. So I guess being, like you said in that example, yeah. being a darker-skinned black man, it seems like you're more masculine, but being a darker-skinned black woman, it also seems like you're more masculine. Um, and that, that's, oh, that's the perception people place upon them, and it's like, there's a complete difference in that experience that I think a lot of people don't want to acknowledge. And even black, like dark skinned black men participate in the degradation of dark skinned black women. Where I feel like that's the group where if anybody's gonna be dealing with the most problems, like, it's them. See, what I'm hearing a lot of is like, I'm hearing not, it's not just a matter of racism at this point. I'm hearing a matter of sexism. I'm hearing a matter of policy. And to like bring it back to your initial question about this whole media thing, it's not a matter of if media is a good platform for it, because at the end of the day, media is just a medium, and it's being run by a specific set of people. And right now, like when I like look around like this university, not just this panel, it's we're tr basically training the next group of people who are taking that over. And so what it's looking like now is what it's sounding like to me is it's not a matter of you know how we're going to fix racism; it's a matter of when. And I think right now we're moving in the right direction. And if, you know, you have these pages that are like glorifying, you know, black women, black men, just black people, uh, it's okay if, you know, we're like, we're not getting it, you know, right, you know, off the first try. Because right now it just shows that we're learning. And we're, we're seeking out the direction to move it. So, you know, give it five, 10, 15 years, I guarantee you we're gonna have this figured out. Wait. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm, hold on, I'm, I'm, hold on. I feel like you were making no. points. You were making some points, and I was like, okay. Yeah. It's almost as if you're saying that, and we just really keep it up with this social media initiative and show off the black this people. This direction that we're, we're moving. I, know, I agree, that yeah. direction is positive, but what we're saying, I think that well, a lot of people were kind of conflicting on. We need to acknowledge, yes, it has an impact. Yes, it does have an impact. Yeah, that impact can be an shit. empowering confidence in young black women. But it's not going to change the impacts of a white supremacy inflict upon black bodies. Which is why it's a matter so of like, policy, like, race. I don't even think it's a matter of policy. Like, we've seen that <laughs> <No, laughs> <like, laughs> policies don't manifest anything materially. Which is How why many we need to times are we going to reform the prison system? No, abolish the fucking prison, right? We're taking these small oh. step changes. Oh. We're taking these, like, these, like, incremental steps, and we're just like, please, white people, give us our freedom if we only like if we only assimilate a little bit if we only like feed into your system a little bit more you'll give us this hard like this mm -hmm. like freedom but it's like no how how many years post slavery are we going to wait for black bodies to stop getting shot black bodies to stop getting locked up black bodies Ooh. to stop having violence manifested again. black bodies from stop to I'm stop getting I'm gonna hop on blown. this one right now I'm, I'm gonna hop on this hop one on it <laughs> so first of all <laughs> if we're looking at policy right now it's not a matter of you know fixing drug policy it's about ending drug policy. Because you look at it, 
the, the penalties for crack and the penalties for cocaine. It's the same damn drug. But if you have cocaine, that's a life, or excuse me, if you have crack, that's a life sentence. If you have cocaine, that's five to ten. Um, let's look at it. Uh, throw something at me. Wait, I'm gonna go for the Okay, I'm gonna go for Wait, that's what I'm saying. Listen, we're just saying, right? Like, yeah, you have like little policies that can give you, like, room for freedom or just, like, these incremental things. You have, like, little policies that can give you, like, room for freedom or just, like, these incremental, like, things that get you towards freedom, but you're never free, right? Like, bodies are still having violence against them, and it doesn't take a, like, how, they're literally policies saying hate crimes are illegal, but people are still hanging black people, people are still um, going to these like um, alt-right meetings, right? Like, mm -hmm. I just feel like it has proven that policies don't mitigate the effects of anti-blackness. And you can go on and say, oh, it's about um, determining the difference between crack and cocaine, but it's just like, why are those police officers allowed to patrol and police black neighborhoods in the first place, because right? Why police? is that system in place in the first place? Why is the prison system something that we want to shovel our system through? Your, so your, you model, your model so you already that? presupposes okay. that the model of politics is just in fear, and okay. it's not. So, like, I'm fucking with it, but we're getting a little bit off, so <laughs> I'm gonna bring us back, um, and I'm just gonna throw another question out there. Um, I know that we've been, discussing like uh, what makes a black person black. And I remember like not too many people like talked about like the culture aspect of it. I know we threw that out there in like the survey and nobody really thinks that culture is a factor. So I just wanted to ask, um, okay, we're getting there. I just wanna ask, um, we had a question about whether having a non-black mom and a black father versus a non-black father and a black mom makes a difference for um, biracial <laughs> children's upbringing. Uh, whether you think that um, one or the other tends to identify more with blackness. Uh, does anybody care to yes. talk about that? Yes. Just yes off that, yes. I have a white mother. Um, it's kind of different because my parents broke up when I was two months old and my father did not raise me at all. I was raised in a town that was 1% black. I was the only black person at the school. I literally, genuinely did not realize I was black until I moved to Atlanta when I was 11. And no one taught me how to be black in any capacity. I am unfamiliar with like almost every entertainment aspect of black culture. You know, obviously I don't speak in abonics ever. Um, it's just, you have to be taught. I absolutely believe that being black is a cultural thing, not completely, but at least partially. And having a black mom specifically, I think, I think there, there are more women uh, who are involved in raising their children than like, primarily than men, I think that's just a statistical fact. And I think when you have a parent, particularly a minority parent, they can teach you how to navigate that experience that a white person can't, like they just can't, they can help you through it, but they can't tell you how. My dad is white, my mom is black, and I grew up with my mom and like, yeah, I would definitely say she taught me more so like, you know, black culture than anything else. But one thing I will like forever be grateful for is she also, you know, taught me how to move like within a white circle too, because even from a young age, she was always telling me, you know, they look at you different. So you need to be aware of that and you need to be ready for that. And I feel like that's something I wouldn't have gotten from my dad because, like, you know, when he was around, like, he definitely, he's aware of the issues, you know, he, under, he, he understands as best as he can. But it would never occur to him to be like, oh, you know, uh, if I'm sitting in a room full of white kids, how am I going to, uh, what's the best way to, you know, not make them, you know, mad at me? He's just gonna be like, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, be white. And, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it works. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, that's all well and good, but I can't exactly do that because, you know, when they look at me, they see a black kid first and foremost. I think white people who, like, uh, have mixed children kind of think that their children will be fine no matter what, as long as they love them. They don't take into account how uh, interactions with, like, extended family will affect them. I, I have, like, 40 second cousins, because I'm Catholic, my family's Catholic, we have a lot of kids, and I'm the only black person in the whole family. And there's only one other person who married interracially, and the kids are half Asian. And they just, they are not sympathetic. They're just not factually. My grandfather donated $1,000 to Trump's border wall, and it's really difficult. It has a huge impact on self-esteem. Even if you, as a white person, think, I love my child, I can help them, um, people don't tend to think about the, the actual experience of having family members who you know like can't accept that part of you. And I think that's, I also feel like uh, white men tend to be like more 
confrontational than white women, and I think they're also more, which is not, I am not defending like white men versus white women who have black spouses. I think that black women can absolutely fetishize white men and like uh, say hurtful things about black men. Um, but I just think that there tends to be a difference, and I think that white women are like less thoughtful about uh, how, how it affects their kids to have their family members not accept them. I think it's easy for me to tell, um, and I, I look, I've had brought this point up with my friends before. It's easy for me to tell when, um, like, a biracial man was raised by a black man, a black mom, or a white mom, mm -hmm. by almost like almost by the women that they seek out, or by the people that they seek out, whoever they would seek out as a romantic partner. Mm -hmm. um, I've just seen that they typically will seek out people if, if they have a white mom. They usually will seek out lighter skinned black women or non-black women and I just feel like that speaks more so as an example of how that experience shapes the type of blackness that they engage in, um, the type of beauty that they idealize and some of the just core factors of their being that they tend to express. Is it necessary for us as black people to gatekeep and define what blackness is and who can be a part of it. No, I'm yes. It's kind of like a defense mechanism only. Oh, well, sorry, a defense mechanism almost like protecting the quote unquote in group from, I guess, Impulses. infractions upon mm -hmm. that. Like people, like we were saying before, people who are in and out of their blackness, um, but want to try to have, I guess, a voice, or try to be a voice of blackness. It's like protecting the voices of people who don't have that option of, you know, being either in or out. I don't know, just like straight up, I don't, I don't mean to like cut you off like that. Um, like, see, I was reading this somewhere, someone was like, everybody want to be Fetty out, but nobody want to lose an eye. It's the same type of way. <laughs> <laughs> Examples, okay. Uh, yeah, and it's the same type of way, like, when, I don't know if that was ableist, but like, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no disrespect, but um, see, uh, when I was so I like grew up in the South, and when I went to school, the first time I saw a white kid sagging his pants, who then turned around and called me, you know, the N word, I was like, I was kind of shook because I was like, you trying to dress like us, you trying to talk like us, Makes but then you making fun of us. <laughs> so, absolutely, like, if you know, I see somebody out here, you know, and you're like you know, trying to rep the culture, but like, you're still trying to put it down, I'm gonna check that, cause. Well, in that example, that person was even black, so they, <laughs> they, they never worry about this. Like, the gate is definitely a lot of people, you know. That's the but, thing. Uh, yeah. I see what you mean, yeah, like, I think it's important. Yeah, no, cause like, at least like, what, a lot of like, what we learn in like sociology classes, like, you don't have to be, you know, black, or you know, Asian, or you know, whatever, to try to partake in that culture. Mm -hmm. And part of gatekeeping goes beyond just looking at skin color. It's looking at, you know, the words you use, the clothes you wear, the ways you act. And, you know, skin, co skin tone definitely factors into that. Mm -hmm. But there's just varying degrees of gatekeeping, or, wow, gatekeeping that occur and that need to be enacted just to, you know, make sure that you're, like, you're protecting black culture, essentially. Okay, so with that, are there, like, any final thoughts? Omar? Um, even in this conversation about gatekeeping, I just want to make sure that we're, like, understanding how we are also actively gatekeeping, like how we don't bring up how, like we, we have an investment in culture, but don't recognize how like poor folks are the, poor black people are the people who start that culture, right? Like queer and trans black people, black folks are the ones who start that culture. So even talking about how we can articulate there's a culture, like understanding like where a ton of that shit comes from in the first place, but also like in, the, in academic spaces, how black folks simultaneously want to distance themselves from those people in the first place. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, just understanding and being aware of how like, even in this space, right, there is gatekeeping happening that actively shuts out the people who started the culture in the first place. So that's... Uh, 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 just like a big part of like, you know, gatekeeping, you know, like acknowledging like blackness, like everybody like, uh, no matter like what the topic of the segment, it's always come back to in some way. Uh, part of being black is acknowledging that struggle. And like, you can't say, you know, uh, this person's uh, black and this like, actually let me rephrase that, like Colin Kaepernick, he wasn't really talked about as being like a black uh, quarterback like that until he started protesting. And I think that's really interesting in how 
you you can you know just because you have the hair the skin you know you can still find a way you know get people to you know i'm not black i'm oj but then once you acknowledge that struggle the like what it really means to be black all bets are off yeah i, I definitely agree we should all acknowledge the struggle and, and what is being black but we also have to say like blackness is not a monolith we do all have different experiences and different um, ways that we express our blackness but in those different experiences, you're going to have a different reaction. So let's not equalize our experiences and say that, oh, as a light-skinned black person, you're going to have the same experience as a dark-skinned black person. Or as a, as a queer black person, you're going to have the same experience as a person who is cisgender or whatever, whatever. Like, there are just different degrees of pain, violence, and the oppression that people have faced that's associated with their form of blackness. So that should be acknowledged as well. Okay, I think that wraps it up then. Um, I would like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, I would like to thank the audience at home who like, are watching us, supporting us. And I just want to say, this is Being Black Emery. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Signing off. <laughs> oh, are we going to do that, that thing? He gonna feel how leave it. Wait, I'm going to go. I don't think we're going to